And uh, I'm going to talk about uh, optimization, uh, which is uh, obviously a very important application, but I'm, I'm not going to go so far as to talk about uh, industrial problems, which Kyle Jamison is going to get into later on in the session, I believe. Um, I'm going to talk about spin glasses, which kind of sit in a, a very important place uh, between physics and optimization. And I'm going to talk about uh, what we can do uh, on the hybrid side to um, provide uh, a feedback loop with the QPU. And I'm also going to talk about uh, studies of coherence that we've done recently and how these all come together uh, for three dimensional spin glasses. So D-Wave has been uh, in business since 1999. Um, should be old enough to be graduating from an undergrad right now, which is quite amazing. Um, and throughout that time, they've had a number of uh, commercial quantum annealing processors. Um, so multiple generations have been available, starting with the D-Wave 1. I started in 2013 when the D-Wave 2 had just been released. Um, and we're now uh, on the D-Wave Advantage. Um, and uh, last year, I believe it was last year, but time flies sometimes, uh, D-Wave uh, announced that they were going to be bifurcating their, their tech tree, basically. And so we're now developing gate model QPUs. Um, and the, the underlying uh, technology is going to be superconducting, which should not be surprising to anybody, uh, because uh, our annealing quantum computers are also superconducting. Super conducting. But I'm not going to talk about the gate model QPUs at all. I'm going to talk about quantum annealing. And so to talk about quantum annealing, it's uh, sometimes useful to talk about simulated annealing first or thermal annealing. Um, if you're living in the, the Iron Age. So simulated annealing is, is a method of optimization uh, by which we uh, attempt to minimize an icing Hamiltonian and a classical icing Hamiltonian. So you have an energy scale J of S in front of this. And S is an annealing parameter that begins at zero and ends at one. This just parameterizes time. It's just normalized time. So as the anneal proceeds, you increase the uh, relative strength of the icing Hamiltonian compared to temperature. And the, the, the classical icing Hamiltonian in this case um, consists of one body and two body terms. So we have longitudinal fields, HI, on each qubit. Uh, and these are they're per qubit programmable. Uh, and these bias the qubit in one direction or the other uh, in, in a classical form, these qubits take uh, spin plus one or minus one. Um, and uh, you also have two body terms, which are programmable jij. So uh, with our sign convention, uh, negative j means that two qubits are joined uh, ferromagnetically, meaning they're compelled to be similar. Uh, and if it's positive, they're compelled to be different. So we have a set of linear and quadratic terms, and uh, these give an energy function. Uh, in general, assuming the graph is not planar or anything like that, uh, optimizing this energy function is an NP-complete problem. And so uh, it maps to many problems of interest in a natural way. So we are not doing thermal annealing. We're not doing simulated annealing. What we're doing is adding quantum fluctuations to this Hamiltonian. And uh, we do that using a transverse field. So we have a, a, a field uh, analogous to a, a field that is literally transverse to the icing moment of a spin glass. Uh, and uh, this, the magnitude of, of this is controlled by gamma of s. And so in the, the quantum annealing Hamiltonian, we actually have a gamma of s that starts high and ends low, and then j of s starts low and starts high. So we, we begin in a system whose ground state is um, a, a trivial but ex, ex completely quantum superposition state and ends up in a, a hard to optimize classical state. And a lot of interesting stuff happens in the middle. So this is the typical picture and how it's been um, for uh, a good number of years, uh, because we have to assume that we're operating at a finite temperature. Uh, and this is because the coherence time of the qubits uh, has historically been much shorter than the uh, length of the anneal. So we can assume that we're coupled to a thermal bath this is no longer the case. We can take away the temperature and we can study the system uh, in absence of a coupling to the thermal bath, essentially. So uh, this is very interesting and we can. this means that we can study quantum phase transitions. Um, and I'm gonna talk about a couple of examples of that. <clears throat> 
just a little bit more history. Um, there were two uh, main uh, motivating results, as, as far as I see it, um, in the late 90s. And one was a lab effort and one was a simulation effort. So the lab effort came from uh, a number of papers, uh, an important one being Brooke et al. and Science in 1999, where they took a disordered icing magnet. So this is literally a three-dimensional icing spin glass, and they subjected it to a, uh, a, a, a transverse magnetic field. And they showed that by attenuating the transverse field rather than attenuating temperature, they could actually uh, get results that were consistent with a dynamical advantage of quantum annealing over simulated annealing or over thermal annealing. So here you see uh, the phase diagram of the spin glass. This is the glass phase and this is the paramagnetic phase. So you can get into this glass phase in two different ways. You can start from a high temperature and uh, lower the temperature, or you can go around here, start at a low temperature and keep the temperature low but started a high transverse field and lower that. So this is quantum annealing and this is thermal annealing. And the other, the other effort in the late 90s uh, came from Katawaki and Nishimori, who showed uh, by simulating the Schrodinger equation that uh, in, in some glass-like systems, um, quantum annealing uh, could help solve problems faster than simulated annealing. Of course, this is a, a, a totally intractable problem, classically simulating uh, the Schrodinger equation. Uh, so this is only up to eight qubits, um, but this was kind of a, a, a seminal paper. I'm going to talk about two broad classes of uh, goals that we want to do. And um, part of co-design, I think, is uh, doing what you can with what you have. Um, this is maybe even a definition of it in a certain sense. Um, so that's where, I mean, these, these are genuinely interesting problems, these simulation problems, but they're, they're a lot easier than, um, than doing certain applications because you get to set the rules and all you have to do is show that it is a quantum system that you're, that you're manifesting or manufacturing. I make it sound really easy, which it is not, and, and many people who work on this can attest to the fact that it is not easy to get these systems to behave the way that you intend them to behave. Um, but uh, optimization, uh, in general, it, it takes you a little bit further out of your wheelhouse, and you have to um, kind of play to somebody else's rules in a certain sense. So uh, the optimization goal is basically to sample low energy states of a classical Hamiltonian, that is at the end of the anneal. And the simulation goal in this case, uh, not for all platforms, but in the case of uh, simulation via quantum annealing, is to sample low energy states of a quantum system, preferably at low temperature, but not always. Um, and that, that's gonna be in the middle of the anneal. So you're gonna be doing what you can to do a projective readout. Now, uh, I mentioned these quadratic terms in the Hamiltonian, JIJ, uh, but because we are uh, using a superconducting technology, not all qubits are coupled to each other. And like most lithographed uh, superconducting quantum processors, uh, we have a quasi two-dimensional geometry of uh, devices. And couplers are devices. So what we have here is the, the Pegasus graph, and this is the, the qubit connectivity graph of the advantage uh, generation of processor. So um, this, this graph was a lot less sparse when I started at D-Wave. And uh, what we were dealing with then was uh, a Chimera graph. So actually, Chimera is what you get if you just take these orange spins, for example, and delete a few more couplers. You'll, you'll get something much more sparse. And there's a few interesting, well, there's a few important things to point out about this graph in comparison to Chimera. Um, so the maximum degree, or the number of neighbors, neighboring qubits that a qubit is coupled to, uh, has gone up from 6 to 15. Uh, a 3D grid miner, I'll show you the embedding in a minute, um has gone from 8 by 8 by 8 to 15 by 15 by 12 but more importantly you can now embed three-dimensional lattices with two qubits per site rather than four qubits per site and if you want all spins to be coupled to one another <clears throat> sorry let me just explain what a grid miner is and or what a, what a miner is uh, and why it's important uh, if 
if you want a an a geometry of coupling that is uh, physically unavailable, you can actually uh, make a chain of qubits behave as a single logical qubit by uh, setting strong ferromagnetic couplers between them. Um, so this is not a perfect solution, but it is a solution to to get expanded connectivity uh, compared to with what compared to what you have physically. So the whole the whole field here is is called graph miners, and there's um, there's a lot of work that's been done on on finding these and and the theory of them as well. So a, a clique miner is one thing that we want to find because it's nice to be able to couple any pair of qubits. A clique is a complete graph. Uh, and the, the size of the clique we can embed has gone up from 64 to 180. Now, this is a picture of a three-dimensional lattice embedding. Um, so we're just, these, these gray, dark gray lines are going to indicate uh, two qubit dimers. And we're going to make these uh, strong ferromagnetic bonds so they, these two qubits act like a single qubit uh, with a renormalized uh, tra effective transverse field on it. Uh, and so we want to couple these qubits together in what ends up being uh, a 3D cubic lattice geometry. And we can do this by laying out these couplers in the X and Y dimensions in the purple and in the Z dimension in the gold. And uh, we had a, a paper on archive where we just briefly showed that um, that uh, going to uh, two qubit chains instead of four qubit chains boosted the performance on 3D spin glasses. Um, Despite the fact that in order to expand this connectivity, uh, we had to make sacrifices in energy scale and coherence. So there are there are always trade offs with these uh, parameters, and so uh, we found that uh, expanding the, the connectivity was uh, valuable. So talking about coherent quantum annealing, I showed these three types of annealing schedule, the classical, the open quantum one, and the, the closed quantum one, or coherent quantum annealing. And in the coherent picture, the environmental response time, i.e. The, the time scale at which you start exchanging energy with the bath, um, is longer than the annealing time. Uh, and so if this is the case, it means that we can appeal to uh, the theory of, of quantum phase transitions. And so uh, that gives us a, a rigorous, or a relatively rigorous at least, uh, framework that we can work in, which is um, much more satisfying uh, than open quantum dynamics, where often we don't really know what is supposed to happen exactly. So the first result I'm going to talk about, uh, it was just uh, published in Nature Physics. And this is a collaboration with Sei Suzuki, Daniel Ladar, and Hidetoshi Nishimori. We just study a 1D chain. It's it's like the, the simplest system. You can imagine simpler systems, but it's a pretty simple system. And the reason that we like it is because there are closed form solutions. You can uh, fermionize the system by Jordan Wigner transformation and therefore uh, simulate it very easily. Um, and more general problems are, are very challenging to simulate. Um, so it's, it's a really good foundational system to study to make sure that you actually understand what's going on. And so we study kibble zurich dynamics. <clears throat> and so there, there are variations on this annealing schedule that you can do basically by uh, changing s as a function of time. So you can kind of zigzag back and forth in the annealing schedule if you want. Um, but we are going to anneal very fast. And... Because we're doing that, uh, we are not allowed any uh, bells and whistles in the annealing schedule. We just go from, from zero to one as fast as possible. Um, it's basically like uh, strapping a rocket to the back of the car. You have to take off the wing mirrors and the, you know, a couple of seats and the steering wheel, and you're just left going in a straight line, hopefully. Um, so. In the 1D chain, uh, when, when, when gamma and J cross each other, you have a quantum phase transition. And in this, this is a second order phase transition uh, that takes you from the paramagnetic phase to a, a ferromagnetic phase or long range ordered phase. And the response time of this system diverges at the critical point. So uh, we're going to study systems on up to 200 spin, uh, 2000 spins, 2000 qubits. 
So the, the gap on the system is tiny. And so you don't expect to anneal adiabatically into the ground state. You expect to generate excitations. And the number of excitations that you uh, generate is dependent on the speed with which you go through the quantum phase transition. And this is called the, the quantum kibble zurich mechanism. Uh, this was previously studied uh, uh, by Misha Lukin's group in, in the Rydberg atom platform. Um, and and we're studying the same foundational system in a, in a, in a similar way. Um, but the, actually, this is not even the, the, the first time that this has been studied in D-wave quantum and either. So previous to this work, it was studied in a couple of papers, but both of these papers studied what we call the quasi-static regime, where it's effectively open quantum system and uh, you're operating at a final a finite temperature. So at the annealing time is longer than one microsecond. So we expect, uh, based on the, the universal critical exponents of a 1D uh, quantum icing chain, we expect a scaling of uh, kink density, um, which is the basically the residual energy density, uh, as a function of annealing time. So it's an inverse square root scaling. So let's just look at those results. And this is the one that we want to focus on right here. I'm not going to show all the data from this paper, but just to give you an idea. So this is a weak coupling regime, and this is a strong coupling regime. And this is the, the fast anneal regime, and this is a slow anneal regime. And you can see that uh, at different temperatures, um, all this data uh, collapses onto one curve when you anneal quickly enough. And this is a strong indication of, of coherent evolution. So you're effectively decoupled from the environment and uh, it doesn't matter what the temperature is because uh, you can't feel it. Um, even more so, uh, it's, it's very pleasing and interesting that we can take a coherent theory line, and this is, this is just taken um, by converting a, a closed form solution to this system uh, by Jarmaga, uh, and we, we just convert it to uh, the form that we get from the annealing schedule. So this is based on single qubit measurements. We get this coherent theory, plug it into an equation, and we, we, can, we can tell exactly or approximately what the kink density should be for a given annealing time. And we're only a few percent off. So that's really great, uh, except for out here where we're, we're significantly far away. And that's because... Um, we are coupled to the bath and, and it's no longer a coherent quantum system, a, a closed quantum system. So there's uh, one very unsatisfying thing about this work, which is, is, is fine. Um, the uh, inverse square root uh, scaling is exactly what you expect from classical diffusion. So this scaling itself does not say that it is, is quantum, it, but it's the fact that we don't, we don't have any fitting parameters in this equation. It's just single qubit measurements to give us the height of this line um, that uh, makes us confident that we know exactly what's going on. <clears throat> if we want to look at a little bit more uh, evidence of quantumness, uh, we can look at this uh, kink kink correlator and this is just something that tells you how bunched the or anti-bunched the, the kinks are. So the kinks are domain walls. And if you have a strong peak uh, at, some, at some correlation length, a normalized correlation length, um, it means that uh, for a given annealing time, you have um, basically kind of like a, it's like a, a standing wave almost. You have a, a a characteristic length scale of your up and down domains, so they tend to to have the same length rather than something uh, random or Boltzmann like. Um, so we see this is the, the the experimental data, and this is the pure exact quantum model um, of the fermionized system, and we see that this peak height is significantly taller than what we see. Now this is not surprising for a few reasons. We have uh, limited entanglement, we have noise, we have uh, disorder in the Hamiltonian, i.e. Uh, analog error. Uh, we have all sorts of sources of error. Um, so that's not surprising to see that this uh, correlator is is smaller than it is in theory. Um, but it, it allows us to kind of diagnose the system. So um, we can tune a couple of parameters. One of it, one of which is the the bond disorder in a in a tensor network method that we use to simulate the system. 
which it, we kind of think of as a stand-in for uh, limited entanglement. And the other is, is, a, is a, a classical uh, analog error that we put on the Hamiltonian, uh, which gives us kind of uh, Gaussian noise. Um, and by combining these two, we can get a really good fit to the experimental data. So this kind of gives us a, a pretty good idea of what's going on just by characterizing the, the, de the deviation between theory and experiment. So this is uh, one really nice thing about quantum simulation experiments, and I'm sure everybody who's done them uh, knows this, that um, nothing is as good as uh, really looking at the bare metal and, and trying to figure out uh, why you deviate from what you expect. It's a, it's a great way to find problems uh, that you can solve. <clears throat> so now I'm going to talk about um, a collaboration with Andrew Sandvik uh, that is uh, currently on archive. And this is basically extending the same method to 3D spin glasses. I'm going to talk about um, two types of spin glasses. They're going to be microscopic and macroscopic. So um, this paper in the 90s of Katawaki and Nishimori was on eight qubits. We could pretty easily do 16 qubits uh, simulating the, the time, de time dependent Schrodinger equation. Uh, you can even go a little bit further than that if you have the patience or the money. Um, but we're gonna study small systems to make sure that we know exactly what's going on and then large systems to see if we get the expected critical scaling associated with the quantum phase transition. So this is this is actually the um, similar phase diagram to uh, what I showed in, in the Brook et al. paper on um, the disordered icing magnet, except the axes are swapped. So this is the transverse field and this is the temperature now. So depending on whether you do thermal annealing or quantum annealing, you have you you, you access the spin glass phase via either a thermal phase transition or a quantum phase transition. And these two phase transitions have uh, different critical exponents associated with them, um, especially the dynamic critical exponent. So uh, we would hope that maybe this is a good way to see a speed up of sorts um, in, the, in the critical scaling of uh, generating correlations or uh, driving down the energy of the states that you're sampling. So that's exactly what we're gonna see. So let me just start by by looking at the small systems, <clears throat> and we're gonna we're gonna make all of these purple couplers plus one or minus one, uniformly at random, and then we're gonna throw out the um, we're gonna throw out all the instances that are that are too easy to be interesting. So these are very small problems, and the fastest we can go is around five nanoseconds. So um, we, we need to kind of post select to, to get ones that are hard, um, but uh, that we can uh, simulate classically. So if we look at the minimum eigengap um, respecting symmetries, uh, respecting parity, sorry, uh, adiabatic quantum computation, which is very closely related to quantum annealing, uh, is predicated on the, 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 the fact that if you go slowly enough through the anneal, uh, relative to the minimum eigengap, then you can remain in the ground state uh, all through the computation. And this is this is the gap. This is the you know the the distance that separates you from an excitation. So if you go too fast compared to the size of the gap, you can do a Landau Zener excitation, end up in the excited state. Um, the challenge uh, with this, of course, and this is very similar to something that uh, Michel Lucan talked about, is that if the gap is too small, uh, then you can't coherently anneal um, because you have to go too slowly to retain coherence. Um, so uh, what we see here is uh, just three uh, cherry picked examples from this ensemble of 100. We chose one with a big gap, a medium gap, and a small gap. And we look at, at quantum annealing and the Schrodinger evolution. So, so this is very similar to what we showed for the 1D case. We um, we take the uh, single qubit measurements, use that to derive uh, or parameterize the, the Schrodinger equation, and then just simulate the time evolution of the Schrodinger equation. And what we get are these uh, square blocks. Um, and this is the probability of exciting out of the ground state and ending up in, in, a, 
exciting out of the ground state and ending up in an excited state. So uh, you can see that the quantum annealing data very closely matches for these three examples, um, the, the form and uh, both qualitatively and quantitatively of the quantum evolution. So this is pretty convincing, but I have chosen these instances. Um, so we also want to look at all the 100 instances and we see a very good correlation between the ground state probability between quantum annealing and uh, the quantum model. So uh, I'm going to just throw back to this uh, 3D embedding, and we're actually going to study these uh, spin glasses for um, a linear system size ranging from 5 to 12. So this is going to go from uh, a, a couple of hundred qubits to a couple of thousand qubits. <clears throat> and these are these are totally impossible to to simulate the the full Schrodinger e equation evolution uh, classically. It's uh, it's unthinkably hard, um, and using things like DMRG is not practical for three D lattices. But we're only looking at um, basically classical observables at the end of the the anneal. So uh, we wouldn't go so far as to say that this is a, a, a quantum supremacy experiment or anything like that. What we're looking at is the critical dynamics of the of the phase transitions. And to get a, a bead on this, we're going to look at uh, what is sometimes called a Parisi order parameter or an Edwards Anderson order parameter or a spin glass overlap order parameter. And that is what you get when you uh, take two independently annealed samples, in this case, <coughs> uh, two replicas on the same uh, random spin glass, and you anneal them and you look at how similar they are. So this is going to range from minus one to one, and you can put an expectation, you can square it and put an expectation on it. And we're also gonna look at um, the Binder cumulant, which is uh, a signature, it's a, used to, to provide a statistical signature of phase transitions. And what we're gonna do is we're going to appeal to something called a dynamic finite size scaling ansatz, which means that we uh, measure Q, we actually measure Q squared, and U, the Binder cumulant, for varying anneal time and system size. And we basically show how we can relate size and time. Uh, so this is the growth of correlation length uh, in terms of the dynamics of the system. So this is quantum annealing on the top, and this is simulated annealing on the bottom. And you can see Q squared and the Binder cumulant and the dynamic finite size scaling ansatz actually tells us that uh, you can collapse the Binder cumulant onto a common curve for all system sizes by shifting the data horizontally depending on the system size. So this is L equals 12 down here, and this is L equals five. If you shift it by L to the power of minus mu, where mu is a, a fitting parameter, you can extract, you, you can, first of all, you get a very convincing collapse on, on, a, on, a, on a universal curve for this data, or a size independent curve. Um, and then you extract mu, which is a, a kibble zurich exponent. So this re is, is related to two exponents right, that, talk, that describe universal scaling. So the first is a dynamic critical exponent plus uh, one over the uh, correlation critical exponent. So if this is big, then uh, the equilibration of the system or the dynamics of the system is slow. And if it's small, then it's fast. Okay, so what we want basically is for quantum annealing to have a smaller mu than, uh, than simulated annealing. And that's exactly what we see. Moreover, by tuning the doping, so this, um, the doping is uh, basically the probability of a coupler being anti-ferromagnetic instead of ferromagnetic. Um, if you tune the doping, you can tune it away from 50-50 uh, without really changing the dynamics of the system. But if you go too far, you leave the, the, the spin glass uh, phase and you end up in the ferromagnetic phase. And then um, you're described by a coarsening exponent, which uh, regardless of the dynamics you're looking at is around two. <clears throat> so, like I said, this is this is spin glasses. So, okay, this is simulated quantum annealing, simulated annealing, and quantum annealing. This simulated quantum annealing is path integral Monte Carlo. 
used to simulate quantum annealing. And so uh, we would expect certain similarities uh, to quantum annealing, whoops, but a, um, but a, but a larger uh, kibble Zurich exponent, which is exactly what we see. And the simulated annealing extracted exponent is similar to uh, theoretical estimates or previous Monte Carlo estimates, I should say. So this is very interesting for people who study spin glasses. Um, and it's very interesting to um, people who study optimization because this is a hard optimization problem. Um, but people who study, who, who want to solve hard optimization problems are often not interested in the bidder cumulant. This is not a figure of merit. The, the figure of merit that people are usually chasing is the energy that you want to minimize. And so we can look at the residual energy scaling and we can find an expression that uh, describes the critical scaling of the residual energy, uh, which is actually quite complicated um, and only applies at the critical point, not at the end of the anneal. So it, we, it's kind of uh, once you hit the critical point, you have to close your eyes and pray that things don't go off the rails too much. Um, but we actually get uh, three uh, theoretical curves for simulated annealing, simulated quantum annealing, and quantum annealing, and they agree fairly well with the with the um, with the experimental evidence. And you can notice a big hump here. This is basically exactly what we saw in the one D system, where the uh, the thermal environment starts to grab you and uh, increase or slow down the decrease of the of the energy. So this is given in terms of uh, Monte Carlo sweeps for simulated annealing and simulated quantum annealing, and for nanoseconds in terms of quantum annealing, because this is a, a real time process. If you take a good implementation on a CPU for simulated annealing and simulated quantum annealing, these are the, the real times that you get for driving down the residual energy. So we have a steeper slope over here, and then we hit the environment, but also we're much faster in absolute terms. But that's just against the CPU, so we should, you know, be expected to, to beat that at some point. Um, but one thing that I want to talk about is uh, moving away from the, the science of quantum phase transitions uh, towards the, um, the realities of optimization. And so you might not want to stop before the environment grabs you. You might just say, well, here's a hundred microseconds. Why shouldn't I? Why shouldn't I anneal for a hundred microseconds? Because the the energy is a lot lower than it is here. Sure, it might be a thousand times longer, but a hundred microseconds is on the order of the readout time of the processor. So you're basically doing it for free anyway. Um, so this is a reality that has to come into play when you do this analysis from an applications perspective. That is sort of not. It doesn't tell you anything. Uh, related to the the quantum critical spin glass dynamics. So uh, I'll use that as a segue to talk about co-design for optimization. <clears throat> so basically, uh, let me just talk about spin glasses and and why we're doing a three dimensional spin glass. So um, and again, this is very similar to what we've seen in in the Rydberg platform. We are using a hardware efficient embedding. So we have uh, not one, but two qubits per logical spin. And um, and we get a nice 3D geometry that is um, that kind of rests on this theoretical foundation that people have uh, built up by studying three-dimensional spin glasses very exhaustively in the literature. Um, and so we are playing to our strengths here, uh, and this is sitting somewhere between a simulation and uh, an application. Um, but I'm going to talk about uh, extending this to 3D spin glasses that are larger than the chip, because um, <clears throat> 5,000 qubits is a, is, is a lot, but it's uh, not necessarily big enough for some problems that you might want to solve. So we're basically going to piggyback off this idea uh, published by Okada et al. in uh, Scientific Reports in 2019, where they uh, play this game with an iterative algorithm. And uh, for those who knew your... Know, those of you who know your algorithms, this is a, a large neighborhood local search algorithm where you basically extract a sub lattice. So I call this a chunk. You take a chunk out of this 3D lattice, you optimize a, uh, 
a derived problem that depends on the current state of this, and then you plug it back in. So here they're using numbers for uh, complete graph embedding, and they show that they can do better. Um, but, but what we've shown is that we can do a lot better by using only two qubits per lattice site. Um, so we can actually take a huge chunk out of this and solve it. So we're gonna go much bigger than 10 by 10 by 10. We're gonna go to 18 by 18 by 18, which is bigger than the chip. Um, and we're gonna take a chunk, we're gonna solve it with a quantum annihilator. we're gonna plug it back in, and we're gonna iterate basically. And while you're solving the, the chunk with a quantum annihilator, you can, you can do some sort of greedy algorithm or you can continue to optimize until you get your, your result back. So instead of looking at a 3D spin glass, I'm just going to show you a two-dimensional two schematic to, to show you how we do this. So we pick a subregion that fits on the chip, say it's a 4x4 lattice, and we clamp everything that's outside that subregion. So we're not going to change these spins, we're just going to change these. But we have to respect the current state of anything that touches the boundary of this region. So if we fix the, the spin to a constant rather than a variable, and mediate it towards this spin with a coupler, it just turns into an effective linear field. So all of these spins that mediated by the couplers, they turn into fields. And so you get a bunch of fields here. You can optimize this derived problem and then move on to another region. And you can do this again and again and again and drive down the energy of your system. And we've done this. Uh, this is in uh, an, an archive preprint. Um, and we've done this within uh, a framework called D-Wave Hybrid, which is basically a, uh, a software package on GitHub that allows you to do really simple uh, hybrid workflows uh, using the D-Wave uh, quantum annealer. So basically, all that we have to do within this framework um, is choose a region that fits on the chip. So we, we have this 3D lattice embedding already. We have to reduce the problem. We have to define how to reduce the problem, which I've already mentioned is, is very easy. And then we need to recombine the QPU output, which is also easy. <clears throat> so this, I mean, if, you're, if your functions are complicated enough, this is just a few lines of code. But this is, this is sitting on a, on a significant software stack that is um, kind of, uh, that uses the Ocean software package. So there's three things that you can do. I mean, there's a lot of things you can do. You could just use the QPU and wait for the solution to come back, or you could do parallel processing. So continue to try to optimize the state while you're waiting for, for output, or you can just post-process the QPU output, which you do with uh, greedy descent. And as you can see, they don't really change the way that you're driving down the error in terms of time. And here we're not just talking about annealing time, we're talking about QPU access time. So this is basically what you get charged if you use the processor. Um, so this includes readout time, programming time, uh, but not network latencies. If we compare this with simulated annealing, which is actually for three dimensional spin glasses is a leading algorithm uh, on relatively short time scales. If you're not gonna use something like parallel tempering to uh, to really work hard and spend a lot of time driving down the energy, uh, simulated annealing is close to as good as it gets. So we're going to use a simple implementation of simulated annealing, and we're going to just come up with a line from uh, steepest greedy descent just to show how bad greedy guessing is or or random guessing. Um, and we're going to compare this this hybrid algorithm with simulated annealing. And you can see that for eight, uh, for 18 by 18 by 18 cubic lattice, uh, we are doing better than simulated annealing. And if instead we look at uh, a hardware native uh, format, so this is a, a Pegasus lattice that we've just put periodic boundaries on. Um, so this is this is basically the the native geometry of the of the D wave processor. This advantage over simulated annealing gets much bigger. So. Um, you know, this is this is what we have, and we're not studying it because somebody asked us to study this particular geometry. We're studying it because this is what performs the best. So, um, what you would like is to to get a a rich geometry so that interesting problems can be most directly applied to the geometry that you actually have. 
So we can think about um, whether or not this uh, large neighborhood local search is doing all the work or the, or the QPU is actually doing the work. And to do this, we can just swap out in the D-Wave hy uh, hybrid uh, software uh, workflow. We just take the call to the solver and we replace it with a call to simulated annealing. Uh, do some napkin math and and figure that you can do about 103 sweeps on your on your chunk in simulated annealing in the same amount of time it takes you to do a QPU call, and and then you can compare some uh, depths of simulated annealing um, against the the QPU performance, and you can see that this is pretty good evidence that the QPU is doing something uh, much stronger than simulated annealing on these on these chunks that you're trying to solve. So it's not just the the uh, the hybrid algorithm that's doing the work. It's the hybrid algorithm and the QPU. So this is a kind of a, a virtuous uh, cycle of development where we have come up with a, a geometry, this Pegasus uh, geometry that, uh, and I'll just flip back to this quickly. Oh, I can't remember how far back I have to go. Here we go. So this geometry was partly motivated by the fact that you can you can embed nice three D lattices uh, very easily in them, and by doing this, it allows us to do uh, strong work in optimization and simulation. And because three D lattices are so uh, canonical as a as a form of optimization problem, we can appeal to all this uh, interesting theory. So people have already studied the, the associated quantum phase transition. They have estimates for the critical exponents. And so we know that the results that we're getting are a good match uh, to theory. So we have strong evidence that we're uh, realizing a manufactured quantum phase transition in a hard optimization problem uh, based on both microscopic and macroscopic evidence. And this is uh, much more impressive in, in some ways than uh, just doing a one dimensional chain. And this also allows us to uh, find a, an efficient hybrid algorithm that is uh, really competitive with uh, simulated annealing. What's well, actually beating the pants off is, well, it's not, it, it's beating simulated annealing. I wouldn't say that that, that quite reaches beating the pants off of simulated annealing. Um, but uh, but these are on problems that don't fit on the processor and that don't fit the native uh, the native geometry. So we have to do the minor embedding. We have to do the hybrid workflow uh, to solve larger than lattice problems. And even with that overhead, uh, we are competitive with uh, what I think can fairly be called state of the art solvers in this context. So just to wrap up, <clears throat> um, We've gone from thermal dynamics to open quantum dynamics to coherent dynamics, and uh, we've seen a lot of uh, interesting physics and some promising results in optimization um, by using uh, the hybrid workflow. And uh, a, a significant point is that we have programmable Schrodinger dynamics on thousands of qubits, and this is something that you you really need to anneal coherently to provide uh, large scale. Uh, really convincing evidence for. So that's what we've done here. And uh, the hybrid algorithms are something that um, are absolutely essential to solving problems for customers. And so it's going to be the way forward, um, not just in the NISC era, but, but beyond, I think. Um, you're only going to have um, part of the work done by the quantum processor, and, and a lot of the work is going to be done uh, in, in hybrid uh, co-design co-designed algorithms. Um, so with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you for your time. Great. Thanks a lot, Andrew. This was a great talk. Super great to see all the progress on quantum annealing architectures and going towards applications. So if everyone who's interested could either drop a question in the chat or send it to me directly, or they can speak up. In the meantime, I'll start off with the first question. Just uh, kind of in the spirit of co-design and looking at your next steps, um, would you say that you're more focused on finding applications that fit the current hardware, or sort of searching for hardware modifications for your algorithms, or some uh, combination of the two? 
we're always looking for applications that fit the hardware. This is like the holy grail of what you want to find in an application because all of the work is done, basically. All you have to do is make a quantum processor, which is easy, right? Um, so we're, we're doing all of it all the time. Um, we're, we're, we're constantly trying to expand all the parameters at once. And, and I'm sure you're familiar with these uneasy trade-offs that you have to make. And it, with, with a qubit coupling geometry, it becomes really uneasy because basically you have to ask yourself, am I going to make an ASIC that is specific to a given application, which is not an unreasonable thing to do at all? Um, or am I going to make something that is going to work uh, pretty well for a broader variety of customers and a broader variety of applications? And, um, you know, if the if the motivation and the money and, and the promise of the application was there, we would absolutely be willing to consider uh, building uh, a, a chip wholesale for a given application. Um, so that's definitely something that is on the radar, um, but uh, it's a constant uh, balancing act.